Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 4, I mean 3, all right? Revelation chapter 3, we're going to uh, go there once again, and uh, grateful that God has given us an opportunity uh, here to look some more at uh, these uh, uh, seven churches of Asia, and looking specifically this morning at the church of Philadelphia, and the things that uh, John encouraged and strengthened uh, them uh, with uh, uh, concerning uh, some of the messages, uh, the lessons that God wanted them uh, to know and to hear uh, this uh, past week, and I, I really appreciate uh, Brother Frenier and Brother Cliff uh, filling in uh, Wednesday service. I uh, trust that uh, you were blessed uh, through that. Uh, Michael and Alex and I had an opportunity to be out in uh, St. Clair, Missouri. You say, where is that? Exactly, all right? Uh, but it's uh, <clears throat> one of those little small towns out in Missouri, uh, but uh, we... Uh, uh, we were able to attend uh, a preacher's uh, conference out there and heard, uh, uh, well, nearly 15 messages in a matter of two and a half days. Uh, so uh, the, the challenge for me today is not to preach all 15 messages to you <laughs> and the two that I have opportunity to preach. Uh, but uh, grateful that uh, the Lord saw fit to allow us uh, that time and uh, time of fellowship as well as instruction, encouragement, and Trust the Lord will use those things just to strengthen uh, uh, our church and uh, just the, uh, the opportunities that God places uh, before us and uh, seeing what the Lord is going to do. Uh, here in <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3, we pick it up in verse 7, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia writes, and this is that uh, area there once again in uh, Turkey and uh, an area where uh, there's even some modern day uh, places that uh, <clears throat> uh, where place people still live here today. Philip, you want to give me control? Uh, all right. I don't know if he gave me control or took control, but we'll find <laughs> out, right? Uh, again, as you think, consider the seven churches. Uh, uh, and we're on to church number six as far as how they are listed here in the book of Revelation. The last church we'll be studying is Laodicea. Uh, but Ephesus, they're all kind of known just for <clears throat> different, um, maybe a point regarding some of the instruction that was given to them. And, and it's not necessarily this is uh, all they should be known for, but Ephesus was the church that left the, the first love. And God was really instructing them to return back to that and make sure uh, that uh, they kept the first things uh, first and prioritized their love and the relationship with the Lord. Smyrna was a very persecuted church as they were facing, uh, really a lot of them were facing it, but Smyrna specifically was pointed out <clears throat> just in the reality of the fact that here they were trying to preach Christ, and it just wasn't wasn't uh, uh, a popular or accepted message, and so they were receiving quite uh, a amount of persecution because of that. Per Pergamos had a problem with the compromise, uh, Thyatira, a little bit of corruptness that was going on there, and we've seen uh, again, uh, one of the common threads uh, that has been taught and preached was the idea that, listen, you have a doctrine, you have truth that you need to stick to, and the temptation is to fall away from that. The temptation uh, is to go with the things of the day, but don't do that. Stay true, uh, and do not let uh, the other uh, religions or the other false uh, um, uh, worship of idols, uh, do not let the corruptness of the, the society or uh, just the, the, the natural practices in that area, do not let them infiltrate and change the way that you've been taught uh, to worship and to uh, practice uh, the doctrines that you've been given. And, and we want to make sure we maintain that as well. Sardis was the one that was uh, dubbed as kind of the dead church. Uh, we've depicted that with uh, the idea of kind of sleeping in church, right? We're here, but we're not really here. We don't want to be like that. We want to strengthen those things that remain. We want to be alive to God and be able to hear uh, spiritually uh, those things that He wants us to know. And now the church here in, in uh, Philadelphia is a very faithful church, a church that God has not really taken any uh, time to point out their issues, but rather has uh, really encouraged them with the things that they have uh, that are going well. Again, this is that uh, area of Al-Sahir, uh, Turkey. Uh, a lot of 
uh, population still uh, living right there in that valley. And, and uh, one of the things that we notice right there along the, uh, the, 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 the mountain range is they're right at the base of that and, and kind of in that lush valley area, but unfortunately an area very susceptible to earthquakes. And so uh, caused them to typically seemingly to be a little bit more of a poor <clears throat> church versus some of the others that were very wealthy. Um, but uh, interesting enough, where there was a lack of material wealth, there seems to be a, a determination to be faithful to God. Uh, and I, I, I see that uh, kind of correlation uh, multiple times. Uh, we get uh, too uh, wealthy, we, get too cons uh, uh, we trust too much in our own resources, and it affects our relationship and our faithfulness of God. Uh, verse 7 uh, this is the characteristics of Christ that is brought out, just like we've seen with so many of the other churches. Uh, and we're grateful that we do have a Savior who is holy, uh, who is true, and who has that key uh, of David, uh, giving him that authority and that, uh, the fact that he is the one that can open, he is the one uh, that can close. And because he has that right, because he has that authority, nobody can override that. And uh, we're grateful uh, for that promise that allows us then to carry forward uh, in ministry. And so we started to see these points here. The first one was by God's power. We'll march through those open doors. Uh, the Lord Jesus opens them. No many closes them. He closes them. No many opens them. But He gives us that ability uh, to walk through uh, those open doors, even to the point that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And that was a promise made to uh the local New Testament church that we carry uh, forward in our mindset of ministry, in our mindset uh, and our abilities that we have uh, to be able to uh, preach Christ, to be able to uh, win the lost, to be able to baptize and disciple and, and to live the life that is pleasing to the Lord. Today, brethren, we don't have any excuse of why we can't do it. Uh, our our God, even though we feel insignificant, where our strength is little, right? Uh, but we still just just obey. Just trust and obey, as the song says, as many times the scripture says, and be committed. Don't deny the name of Christ. Those are very simple things to do. What the Lord says, we follow who the Lord is, we stay true to. And God blesses that and allows us the opportunities to carry onward uh, in that ministry. We saw this. Uh, in, Paul, in the calling that Paul recognized, it, uh, it doesn't need somebody that's smart and somebody that's strong and somebody that uh, uh, has a, a, a high place in society, but rather God uses the opposite of that, uh, those people that are weak, those people that are despised, those people that are base. And he uses those by calling them and by empowering them to be able uh, to do His work. And in the end, why is it? Because all the glory goes to God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about our, our wonderful Lord. Uh, God's power will march through the open doors. David and Goliath was a wonderful example of this. When you consider just uh, how seemingly insignificant David was, he's out there on the battlefield because he's running an errand for Dad to deliver food to the warriors, to the, uh, the, the brothers who were actually enlisted in the army. And I don't think for a moment that David was some inexperienced little, you know, 10-year-old boy that never seen battle. Uh, that's quite the opposite. Uh, there had been some things that God had done in his life prior to this, but here in this particular moment, he is not enlisted in the army. He was keeping the sheep at home. Uh, and yet he shows up and he hears Goliath's statements. And uh, Goliath made a mistake in opening his mouth, right? Uh, if he had kept his mouth shut and everybody would have seen the, the armor and the sword and the stature, the size, the spear that, that, that he uh, possessed, then maybe, uh, like the nation of Israel, very scared and, and um, knees knocking and teeth chattering, right? And not sure what to do and how to do it. And yet David walks up and he hears what Goliath has to say. And that emboldens him and empowers him, right? Because he knows it's not by his might. He knows it's by God's power that he can defeat this giant. And I know for us, again, um, I, I've seen, said this many times 
because of our familiarity with the scriptures and knowing the whole story, sometimes it puts us at a little disadvantage in being able to experience the full gamut of emotions and thing that David must have experienced prior to going up to the giant. And just like Shadrach and Meshach, prior going into the fiery furnace, you know, we're like, oh, God took care of you. Oh, God helped you defeat that. Oh, God did this and God did that. And yeah, yeah but what about when you didn't know what was going to happen? What about when you hadn't had the final result? Uh, and yet still, uh, I like what David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with sword, with a spear, with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. God, just in case you didn't hear it, I heard it. <laughs> Remember what he said about you. And let's go forward with this. And uh, we see uh, that stone being hurled. We see De uh, Goliath. Uh, falling down, doesn't matter how big you are, right? Uh, what did they used to say in football all the time, Brother Patrick? The bigger you are, the harder you fall, or something like that, if you know? I don't know. <laughs> the bigger you are, the harder you fall. But it hurts both of The bigger you are, the harder you fall. And that was to try to somehow embolden the, the, the ones of us that weren't so big, right? Uh, that we still could have some kind of effect on the others. But with God, we can. And despite uh, how large and how dominant and, and how uh, well-financed the enemy may seem, God is still greater than our enemy. And we can through uh, Him. So by God's power, we march through those open doors. Uh, and that's something we can never forget. And then we looked at God's protection uh, by God's protection, our position will be established before uh, others. We see that in verse 9. Verse 9 of Revelation chapter 3, Behold, I'll make them a synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, but are not. They do lie, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. And this we saw in, in the reality of that synagogue, that aspect of this assembly of Jews is also a building in which... Uh, they did assemble, and when they say they're right, they say they're true, they say that they're believing uh, what is supposed to be taught, the Lord is the one that, is, that establishes that, right? Uh, anybody can say they're right. Anybody can say uh, that this is the way it is, this is the, the path that you should take, but we don't have that right to determine that. Only God does. But when God determines it, you got to understand, by the fact that he determines what is true, he also determines what is not true. And uh, if you're not following what he has stated to be true, then you're following that which is false. And here, uh, that, the picture that we saw uh, with the Apostle Paul, uh, who started out as Saul, uh, he was involved in the death of Stephen, then he took these letters, or desired letters, uh, from the, the synagogue, uh, from those that were... Part of uh, what we would say Jude is, with, is Judaism, all right? Uh, the fact that he was following so closely uh, the Jewish mindset, the Jewish religion, which had kind of changed a little bit. And we know that when Jesus showed up on the scene, they rejected him as the Messiah and, and carried on in their traditions, right? Well, that carries on into after Jesus is uh, uh, resurrected. And now we have this early church stage that is taking place in these seven churches of Asia that are trying to carry forth in the absence of Christ. You still have uh, the, the mindset of those religious individuals and the practices that they took place in. And, and unfortunately, they were creating some of the greatest problems for these early believers, these early Christians. And some of the things that we see uh, with um, uh, the, the, the mindsets of those uh, Jewish um, Sadducees and Pharisees, the priests and the people, uh, the synagogues that they established, we see that actually morph then into a lot of what we know as religions even today. It's interesting to me when you study certain religions, and I'm talking about mainstream denominations, it's interesting to me that you can actually go back into the New Testament and you can see many of those same mindsets even though it was called a different religion then, okay? Even though it was maybe coming, uh, for instance, coming out of Judaism and, and what it is now turned into, and yet some of the practices of what we would say is Christian religions 
actually fit some of the same practices that the Jews had of that day. And, and, and what was it? Really, it came all, the way, all down to, it's what I can do, not the relationship inside that I have with God through Jesus Christ. Uh, we have to be careful with that even today, but what happened here, Saul's trying to go out and he's trying to uh, cause havoc, and he did create havoc, but then we see the Lord Jesus Christ intervening uh, in his life, and even, even when he was journeying with those uh, letters to go wreak havoc in the churches in Damascus, um, that's the Lord intervened right then and there and stopped uh, that particular situation. And so we see that because God is the one that pr protects uh, he is the one that uh, intervenes within our life to provide us with the opportunities to live for Him. Then what happens? Our position becomes established before others. I will make them to come and worship before Thy feet and to know that I have loved Thee. Man, what a... What better... I don't know, commendation than for the Lord to say, hey, everybody, I want you to know something. I love that person. Especially in front of your enemies. <laughs> Especially in front of your enemies who are claiming that you don't even know God and that they do. <laughs> and yet when he comes and he says, no, wait a minute. I don't care what you think and what you say. Let me tell you something. My love is on that individual or on that church right there. And they may be small. They may be insignificant. They may not have a lot of strength. You may be really putting the fire to them and you may be treating them wrong. And, and, and even in your fervor thinking you're right, treating them wrong. But I'm going to tell you something. You're wrong. You're of the synagogue of Satan. They're right. I love them. And you know this idea of them coming and uh, worshiping before thy feet. You know, let's make sure we understand that is not because God wants others to worship us. Right. Okay? It's not coming and saying, oh, how great Miss Jackie is. Let's all praise and adore her, right? Especially because tomorrow's her birthday. <laughs> but... <laughs> but instead... It's for God to recognize, I mean for others to recognize that it is God who we are serving. God who we are living for. God who's intervened in our life to allow our position to be established for others. When that is in the right context, in the right uh, situation, God's the one that gets the glory. We don't have to worry then about getting proud. We don't have to worry about others coming before us and bowing down and, oh, man, that just makes me feel so good. No, we, just, we are able to just at that point look and recognize what are they really admitting to. They're admitting that their religion is false and that God is true. And that's what we should desire in our life. You see, when God establishes a care of us, others are going to be able to see Christ through us. And remember what we've said with this concept, right? When do you usually see the protection stand out? When do you usually see the care? It's when we're going through the difficulties. Right. It's when there's danger. It's when there's uh, things that should overcome us and overwhelm us. It's when the trials in life are, are real and we're facing them. And we have the tendency to either run away from them or to allow God to help us and keep us through them. That's when others can really see Christ in us when we respond in those difficulties, right? We recognize this, uh, I, I think, in, in the life of Moses. Moses, you might want to look over there. You can see it here and uh, on the screen. But Exodus chapter 33, and uh, we'll also mention this in the next service as well. It kind of fits with... Uh, both messages that God has provided us with. But when you think about Moses, the great leader of the nation of Israel, uh, he had quite the task. Uh, uh, he was uh, kind of raised there in Egypt when he was 40 years old. 
Uh, he really became passionate about defending uh, his uh, own people, and so he slew an Egyptian and then found out that others saw it, and so he took off and spent 40 years in the wilderness, and while he was there on the backside of the desert and keeping sheep and uh, had started a family and everything seemed to be okay, status quo, right? And God said, nope, this is not what I have for you. <laughs> I've gotten this time in your life and I understand why and things of that sort, but now it's time for me to send you back to Egypt and it's time for me to lead my people out of that place and I'm going to help you, I'm going to use you to be able to accomplish that. And Moses felt very insignificant in regards to that opportunity, right? To the point that he tried to get God to send somebody else. Uh, he tried to give excuses of why he couldn't. And, and God finally just said, look, you, you, it's time, let's go, right? Stop, stop whining and crying and let me show myself strong through uh, your life. And, and God encouraged Moses in a few things to be able to do that. And now what we see here in Exodus chapter 33, we see that, that Moses had this mindset. He had this, this conviction, uh, if you will, in his heart. And it's the same conviction that, that we all need. I think it's the same conviction that the Church of Philadelphia had uh, when it came to, uh, we're gonna, we don't have a lot of strength, we don't have these, <clears throat> the, the abilities to do it, but the Lord's opened the doors, we need to walk through them. How are we going to do that? So notice here what it says. Now therefore I pray thee, this is Moses in his discussion with God. If I have found grace in thy sight. Now what is grace? Grace is that empowerment to be able to accomplish God's will. It's giving us that which we do not deserve. Right? Mercy is when we deserve something and God withholds that. Uh, usually some form of punishment or consequence uh, for our wrong actions. But grace on the other hand is... I know that you're not capable, however, I'm going to empower you. Paul said it, my grace, or God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. When Paul tried to uh, um, ask God to remove that thorn in the flesh, Lord, just take it away, though, I don't have to worry about it. And then we're all good. And God said, no, I'm not going to take it away, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide you with the ability to be able to handle that thorn in the flesh. And so Paul was able to... To, to continue to minister despite whatever it was. And I know why God didn't tell us what it was, right? Because most of us would go, well, wow, that's not my thorn. My thorn is a whole lot worse. Paul could have that grace for that, but it's not good enough for this. But no, it's a, it's a thorn. It's a thorn. God's grace is sufficient. Here's what he said. Show me now thy way that I may know thee. Okay, so I need to see the way that I need to walk so that, Lord, I can, I can understand you. I can have that... That, that understanding of saying uh, who you are, what you can do, how you can work in my life, that I may find grace in thy sight. And consider that this nation is thy people. Uh, it's funny how sometimes um, uh, Moses would remind God that, and God would remind Moses that. <laughs> uh, sometimes God was saying, get out of my way, Moses, I'm going to destroy them. And Moses said, no, 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 wait, Lord, remember, that you're their, they're your people. Uh, and then other times, you know, God was saying, uh, listen, take your people and get on with life, you know. Uh, and he said, my presence shall go with thee. Okay? God's protection, I think, is, is something that we find in God's presence. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when God's with us, we know that we're protected. Uh, think about it. You're... The idea of a protector, right? A bodyguard. What good is a bodyguard if he's at home sleeping? <laughs> and you're out in public. <laughs> this bodyguard thing is not going to work very well, right? But the whole concept of a bodyguard is for them to be right with you, wherever you are, watching over you and protecting you. Okay, well, when we think about it, God's presence essentially equals his protection. So Moses is saying in this, listen, um, uh, or God's saying, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, this is Moses saying to God, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Okay? There may be an open door, but Lord, if you're not going through it with me, then I'm not going through it. Because I've got to have you with me, right? 
For wherein shall be known here that I and thy people would find grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. What separates us? The presence of God. And in the presence of God is his protection. And when he's with us and he protects us, then what happens, our position before others then becomes established. That's exactly what happened with Moses. And then when it happened with Moses before the nation of Israel, then it happened as a whole with Moses and the nation of Israel before the other heathen lands. Because what did they recognize? We see it when, when the, with Rahab uh, and the spies and her testimony to them. Man, our hearts are melted because we know God's with you. We've seen it. We've, we've heard about it. We know that we're in trouble because God is with you. You know, it, it, maybe we don't want people necessarily to fear us, like we're going to go and kill them and all this kind of stuff, but we want people to see that same reality in our lives. That they say, whoa, wait a minute. There's something different about that church. God is with them. Because God is with them. Wow. Wow. We can see God working in their life, and we recognize there is a real reality to the God that they serve. And hopefully that in turn encourages them then to come and want to be a part, right? To see that God loves us. Well, let's move on here this morning. By God's preserving, we can maintain a right relationship with Him. Okay, so by God's preserving, we maintain a right relationship with Him. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience... I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Okay, so by God's preserving, we can maintain a right relationship uh, with Him. And this is uh, something that, again, we need to understand, we need to, to recognize so that, so that as it's a reality in our life, then it becomes a benefit uh, to us accomplishing what God wants. Take it piece by piece. First of all, thou hast kept the word of my patience. Now, what does that mean, right? Thou hast kept the word of my patience. Well, if you think about it, uh, uh, we know that keeping is, is the idea of guarding and protecting or the idea of obeying, okay? So we're going to keep and we're going to guard, we're going to protect, we're going to, we're going to obey the word. The word would be something that was communicated, something that was spoken. And we know it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, so it's the word that Jesus has spoken. And he describes his word specifically as the word of his what? Patience. Now what is patience? I don't know. <laughs> something all of us wish we had. <laughs> Work in yeah, that's right. There you go. Work in progress. Except the patience is one of those things that all of us wish we had, but nobody wants to get because <laughs> tribulation is what worketh patience. Uh, uh, when you think about it, though, listen, with patience, when we're talking about keeping the word of whose patience, though? Whose? Okay, Christ or the Lord Jesus. It's his patience, not my patience. Okay, so I don't have to worry about keeping the word of my patience as far as me. But the word of the Lord Jesus is patience. Now, <clears throat> if you consider what would be a word or a truth that Jesus has communicated to us that we need to keep that would, that would relate to patience. Tough one, isn't it? All right, Ashley. And he's coming back. Okay, how about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Has it happened yet? No. Is it important for us to be patient in relation to that? Yes. Okay, because we have to wait for it. We have to watch for it. We have to be ready for it. But in all of the watching and the, and the, and the being ready and being prepared, it's necessary because we don't know when it's going to happen that we be patient in regards to it. I think it also works right in with the idea of the gospel. Okay, the gospel. Why is the gospel something of patience? When we uh, 
uh, hear the, the truth of the idea that we are sinners and we need to repent of that sin. We need to repent of uh, that condition of being sin. We need admit, a sinner be admit before God that we are wrong and, and that His law is right and that we have violated that law and that there's nothing in and of ourselves that we can do uh, to undo all the wrong that we have committed. And then in the process of that, we place our faith and trust on the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, as that, uh, uh, that substitute for our sin. Fa the fact that when He died and he, and he was buried, He rose again, He paid the price of my sin. Okay, so when I accept that, when I keep that, when I, when I am born again, do I instantly at that moment become a perfect individual and go up and be with the Lord in heaven? No. Man. So now, and, and let's just all be honest, I mean, that would be a great plan the Lord could enact for us, right? <laughs> Okay, Lord, I'm here, and when I the moment I get saved, go ahead and bring just take me up there with you. But instead, it becomes a word of patience. Why? Well, because I'm saved now, and there's this process that is taking place called the process of sanctification. There's the Lord working in my life and through my life. There's the time that He has given me here on this earth to live for Him and to betray others before Him. And the reality is this, is I have to keep that gospel. I have to keep that truth ready in my heart. I have to maintain that focus on the Lord as His child, knowing that He's my Father and I want to please Him. And at some point in time, He will see fit to call me home or to come back and grab me. And in the meantime, what is it? It's learning to keep the word of patience. Learning to abide by the truth until that moment comes about. Um, minor off topic, but that verse 310, is he talking there, uh, also keep thee from the hour of temptation? Is that talking about rapture, or is that talking to the Jews who have to stay behind? Okay, so let's talk about that next then. All right, so it kept the word of my patience, right? Because, because you kept the word of my patience. In turn, I, who's I? Jesus Christ also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Okay, now when studying through that and trying to really uh, figure it out, determine it a little bit, it's, a, it's not the most easy thing to define. When we think of temptation, we think of uh, multiple aspects of it, all right? Uh, first of all, the, some of the basic temptation that we consider is when we are tempted to sin. That can happen at any one point in life, right? But every man is uh, uh, tempted or drawn away from his own lust and enticed. And when that lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, sin bringeth forth death, Okay? So we see those steps, we see that process, we see that the devil tempts us with evil, we see the world uh, being part of that temptation, and ultimately our flesh is probably the, the worst part that is right there with us that, that gives in to temptation. When I think, though, of the hour of temptation, I almost think that it, it kind of fits and, and sort of uh, really, to me, relates a little bit with the, the idea of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was about to go to the cross. You know, he was talking about the, uh, the Lord delivering me from this hour of temptation. The Lord deliver me from this particular moment when I know that I'm going to have to carry all the sin of the world on my shoulders. When I'm going to have to go to the cross and I'm going to have to shed my blood and die. We see that as kind of that one major incident, major uh, event that occurred in the Lord Jesus Christ's life right before what the, the the plan of salvation being completed. So that was a an hour of temptation in which he knew he had something major to perform, and the temptation there, of course, was to draw back and not go through with it, even though I knew it was God's plan. And yet, what did Lord Jesus Christ say? Not my will, but Thy will be done. Okay. So you think about it in that sense. 
But in this particular verse, what do we see? Which shall come upon what? All, All the world. So now we've gone a little bit further in defining what that hour of temptation is from. Now, do I believe the Lord can keep us from temptation? I do. I don't believe there's any temptation that has come upon us, but such is common to man that the Lord has made a way of escape. Right? So any kind of uh, time that we're drawn away of our own lust, that we're enticed, God has given us the opportunity to get out of it. Instead of carrying through with it, instead of falling into sin, the Lord has provided a way out. We know that. But, when we consider just this as a whole, and of course we're in the book of Revelation anyway, so that kind of sets us up already. But when we consider as a whole, we recognize that this hour of temptation is not just something we experience, but rather it is something that is going to come upon all the world. Go ahead, Mike. Do you think it's related to, the, to what Jesus, was, or what Paul was saying to the couple of the churches, particularly Thessalonica, about the, the concern that they had that uh, about things about the rapture, about the time of the tribulation, and they they anticipated it was going to be on them imminently, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe he's addressing that same concern to them, saying, because of your patience and your endurance through the trials that you they just referenced the verse before, I'm going to you know I'm going to save you through this. Yeah, you're not going to experience the things that you think that you're fearing. Absolutely, I do think it does point towards. Uh, the idea that we have of the end times, right? There's a lot of things that we're a little unsure about, uh, but there are some things that we know that God has said, and yet, I don't know about you, but I want to make sure that God's got me in that moment. <laughs> because the last thing I want to do is experience the same kind of judgment that the rest of the world is going to experience. And when we say the world, upon all the world, and, and what does it say? To them that dwell upon the earth. Them that dwell upon the earth. Uh, here, as, you, as you're putting all this together, it's describing what that hour of temptation is. Well, we know that there is a couple of specific judgments that is mentioned in the, in the last times, in the end times, uh, that we really are grateful today that we do not have to be a part of that. But why do we not have to be a part of that? Because we kept the word of my patience. Because through real, true, biblical salvation, we've been converted, we've been made a child of God, and the Lord says, because we are His child, His wrath shall not abide on us. Amen. I love that. I love that promise that God has given to us. And so when the hour of temptation comes upon the world and God stands in, in judgment of all the world, you know what we have to rest assured of? Is that God has delivered us or will keep us from that hour. I think of it, maybe if you could think of it in this way, probably one of the easiest ways to see it applied is the fact that, you know, prior to uh, any kind of tribulation period here on this earth, what happens first? The rapture. the rapture. Guess what the rapture does for us? It delivers us from the hour of temptation. <laughs> it delivers us from having to go through those horrible seven years that are going to take place as a refining time to get people to wake up and understand that there is truly a God that is in control. But you know what? Because I've watched for that rapture, because I've been patient for that rapture, because I've wit said, Lord, even so, come. You know that keeping of all of that. And I'm not saying that we've earned our way to heaven by any means. I think you understand what I mean. As a saved individual, we are to continue in that word of patience. And when we do so, the Lord delivers us from that hour of temptation, even though it's going to come upon everyone else and all the world. And it's going to come to try them. So what does it really get back to? Well, by God's preserving, I can maintain a right relationship with Him. Our salvation is all about what God has done for us. It's not, it's not, it's not my salvation. It's not what I concocted. It's His salvation. But the keeping of it and the preserving of it is also... All about the power of God's working in me. 
You see, this is the whole idea. If, if we go along with so many other theories and ideas from so many other people, I can work my way there. I can get there because I'm a pretty good person. But do you realize what you're saying in that? Is that as long as you maintain a good life, then un but you're going to have to keep maintaining that. You're going to keep being good. You're going to keep carrying on. Because the reality is, if your salvation is based in you, then you're also the one that's got to keep it. And I can't even imagine the pressure that must come from that, right? Because which one of us knows at which moment that we are going to leave this earth and have to make sure that we have kept it up to that point? It's not really possible. But because God's power is involved in our salvation, God's preserving is what helps us then to maintain that right relationship with Him. Mm -hmm. I just love the fact that our God, He encourages us in these things of living for Him and loving Him and serving Him and and like this church of Philadelphia, being faithful to Him. But have you seen that He's made it pretty plain and clear? Church of Philadelphia, listen. I know these things are really not within your power to do. I know you're a little, a little strength. I know you're insignificant. I know that you struggle. But I got you. And because I'm with you, protecting you. You're going to be established before others. Because I'm preserving you. Huh, you can keep a right relationship with me. You can carry on. You can live for me. You can love me. You can keep being the church that I want you to be. Because our God promises to keep us. Brethren, we have nothing to fear. Uh. We have nothing to, to look to the future and say, oh no, I don't know about that. Oh no, not sure that we're going to be okay there. No. God's got us. He's going to deliver us. And we'll just look at next, not next week, because next week's Easter. All right? We'll look at the <clears throat> following week about God's promise. We'll, we will confidently and courageously remain faithful and service to Him. Father, thank you so much for the things you've taught us here this morning. Keep us as we carry on today. That, Lord, will do it in your strength and your power and your ability. And that, Father, you'll reward accordingly. We're so grateful that we have such an amazing God to be able to serve, to be able to know. And, Lord, I pray that as you teach us these truths concerning you and the work that you do in our life, that, Lord, we'll be encouraged to carry on in this world as a witness for you. Help us as we uh, <clears throat> uh, transition from this service to the next. The Lord, you'll continue that work that you've already begun. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.